Welcome back. My next guest is the great Luke Jones doing great things for WNST Baltimore. Positive as we approach our 25th anniversary on the airwaves. Luke, of course, is a big, big, huge part of what we do around here. Luke, always a pleasure to have you on. Dennis, how are you, my friend? It's good to talk to you after a couple of weeks. Uh, you know, I'm glad, glad you had a respite, but uh, even even happier to have you back now. Appreciate that. I'm trying to hold on to that um, that holiday buzz. Uh, I, that's what they call it over in Europe. They don't go on vacation. They go on holiday, <laughs> holiday which I'm going to adopt that, I think. I think it's a, a great way to look at it. It's a holiday, right? It's a personal holiday. There you go. And, and look, you come back and the Orioles are in first place. So uh, what do you know? I mean, not, not that they were doing poorly before you left, but... Uh, speaks to the ebb and flow of, of, of a 100, 162 game season, and yeah. uh, despite the disappointment of, of the series loss against the Phillies, with you know some some concerns there, I, I think bullpen concerns persist. I think you could still certainly make an argument for another starting pitcher addition, especially when you know you question you know is Tyler Wells tiring a little bit? You know Kyle Bradish is going to be up around uh, a career high in innings. All these young pitchers are really kind of maxing out or will be over the next couple of months. So, so you have that, you have the injury, uh, not just to Cedric Mullins coming out of the all-star break, but now Aaron Hicks on the IL Gunnar Henderson uh, dealing with a little bit of a sore back, although he expects to be back in the lineup against the Yankees this weekend. So, you know, nothing to panic over, but as we are just days away from the trade deadline, uh, which is August 1st, next week, uh, Mike Elias kind of looking at, so the, the current roster, looking at some of the needs, looking at the potential needs, potential deficiencies as you're trying to project out the next couple months. I mean, barring something completely unforeseen, barring a complete collapse, this team's going to be in the postseason. But what can you potentially do to help your chances in October? You certainly want to maintain your long term organizational health uh, in terms of your farm system. But uh, I think Mike Elias, as we've been saying for a while, and uh, the, 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 nothing has changed, even with you know, the disappointment of dropping a couple games against the Phillies. You know, what can you do that's feasible, that makes sense to fortify your roster for the, the final two months of the season? And you know, we'll see how that plays out. Unfortunately, I, I just mentioned bullpen arms and starting pitching. Most contenders are looking for that, and there's there are only so many of those options out there that are going to move the needle let's say so sometimes easier said than done but we'll see what mike elias the buyer general manager has in store for us after seeing him as a seller here in recent years look the frustration for me with this club is uh, particularly in, in in the series against the phillies is they those last two games were winnable but on the other hand when you're playing when you're winning a lot of one run games you're going to be in that position where sometimes in the last yeah. inning or two the the game gets away uh, from you, but the the overall uh, body of work certainly is there, right? Still leading the division over the Rays. Big weekend against the Yankees. I saw a memo that uh, the parking is sold out. They have an event at the CFG Arena uh, Saturday night, so Baltimore is going to be really really hopping with people this weekend. No question about it. And I'm really glad that you brought up the point about when you play so many close games, when you play so many one run games. I mean, the Orioles this year, you know, uh, 19 and 10 in one run games. It feels like they should have more than that. Uh, it feels like they should have more than 29 one run games that they've played this year. But uh, it just speaks to how well they've done in those close games. But the reality is, Dennis, and, you know, this is when we get into analytics and trying to see where a team is, where it's going. The Orioles have played a lot of close games and history bears out that over the course of a long season, even the best teams are generally going to be closer to 500 in that category. So that's not to say to, to worry about the Orioles per se, but it's to put in the proper context what happened the last couple nights uh, against the Phillies. I mean, for me, it was really game two of the series where, you know, Brandon Hyde stayed away from Bat uh, Felix Batista in the ninth inning, wanted to give him back-to-back -back off nights, and Yenier Cano struggled. Jorge Mateo had a, a critical misplay that, that has a lot of fans up in arms in terms of his roster spot, but I go back to early in that game. They had a bases loaded, no out situation against Taiwan Walker, where they really could have opened up a, a big lead they and did. they squandered it. So yeah. so you have to look at the game in, in its entirety, right? I mean, it's easy to point to what happens in the eighth and ninth inning. Uh, and, and certainly, I've been saying this for a while, I want to see this team 
add more bullpen pieces. And, you know, Fujinami had a, a really encouraging outing. On Tuesday night, hopefully there's more of that. The kid, the, the, the he's not a kid; he's 29 years old. The Japanese right-hander, it's got a good arm. Uh, I, I don't think there's any any doubting that. But the consistency is the question. So, would love to see them add another high leverage reliever with some closing experience. I mean, David Robertson is one name that that's expected to be out on the market and available. You know, he's done it for a long time. I don't think it would cost a lot in terms of prospects to get him. Uh, but boy, it'd be nice to have someone like that to pair with Bautista uh, and Cano, you know, not giving up on him, but certainly sure. acknowledging he hasn't been quite as dominant and as consistent as he was earlier in the year, which was always going to be tough, but another arm that you can count on in the late innings. And on those nights when Felix Bautista isn't available, hand the reins over to that individual. So it doesn't have to be David Robertson. That's just one name that's out there uh, of several who have some closing experience and he has playoff experience as well. So, but again, come go back to what happened earlier in the game, you know, on, on that night, they had a chance to really open up a, a, a pretty sizable lead uh, against the, the Philly starter and they, and they didn't get the job done and they let Philadelphia hang around. And again, close games, you're going to be on the wrong end of some of those. Uh, and certainly the Orioles saw that the last couple nights. And, but let's also keep in mind, still have the best record in the, in the American league and still in first place in the AL. So the reality is no team's perfect. And every team goes through losses, especially in a sport like football or baseball, sure. unlike football where, you know, you might go 15 and two in your best season or something like that. Uh, but you know, the, it's just, like I said, the ebb and flow uh, of what happens over 162. <laughs> But I do think this series loss to the Phillies probably did magnify a little bit of the urgency that I think they should have been feeling all along uh, in terms of trying to add another piece or two at the trade deadline to, to, to help your chances come October. Luke, as, as I've watched uh, probably more games this season than, than in the last decade, uh, what's, what's obvious to me is the need for – the uh, electronic umpire to make its appearance sooner rather than later. <laughs> Some of these calls, and I get it, the guys were throwing the ball 98, 100 miles an hour. The umps aren't going to be perfect. The ball moves. They have different angles. But I think there's still a need. There's still going to be a need for the ump to make calls, et cetera. But I do think for the consistency of, and for the good of the game, the sooner they can address the strike zone, the better. Yeah, I, I think there's absolutely merit to that. And and you know me, Dennis, I'm not someone who likes to get into officiating in, in any understood, sport understood. that much because no, no, I'm just saying in a general sense, but, and, and I don't have data to reinforce this, but it does feel at least anecdotally, at least for me watching games on a daily basis, it does feel like there's been a little less consistency than even the, la the last several years. And look, there are, there are, there's technology that's been in place to evaluate uh, home plate umpires, ball strike calls. Uh, I'll also remind everyone that, you know, the, the center field camera is not always perfectly aligned. The, the box that they put up uh, that TV puts up, you know, it's one thing right. to talk about that compared to Statcast or some of the other computer technology they have is not always entirely accurate. Uh, and there are certainly some pitches that look better than others that are, aren't called strikes so, or are called strikes and really aren't strikes. Uh, but it does seem like there's been less consistency and, you know, there, there was some of that over the course of the last couple series, you know, al yeah. although I also looked at some of the numbers the following day and a couple of the umpires actually had a better night than, than fans may, uh, may have thought. So I think it's inevitable that, that we're going to get automated strikes, balls and strikes at some point here in the not too distant future. I, I think the big question is, do you want to go all the way with that? There have been others who have explored a challenge system where it would not come from the manager, but it would be from the catcher, the hitter, or the pitcher. And, and each side would only have X number of challenges per game. Right. It would almost be like a system with tennis, sure. you know, what you see with that. So, sure. and, and not to cut you, know, you off, but there was, I, a, I, there was a, a pitch the no, other night, it, maybe Wednesday night, Mateo was at bat, may have been a three and two count, and when they showed the, the replay for yeah. the overhead cam and he had jumped out of the way, clearly that was a ball. And he, he was on his way yeah. to first base and he stopped like, you gotta be kidding me. And, and yeah. I understood and, and the frustration from the player. Uh, especially when you're talking about Jorge Mateo, whose offense has been a disaster since the beginning of May. Yeah. Yes. I, I mean, I, I, I do 
I mean, I'm not opposed to it whatsoever. I I think there's certainly, you know, it's not as though the home plate umpire would disappear. So the aesthetics of it would not be as dramatic as I think some baseball purists have, have, have viewed it. Uh, however, I do think there's, you know, there, there are hidden costs, consequences, at least things to think about. You know, for example, we've all watched baseball before where it's 12 to one in the ninth inning and, you know, whether it's a position player comes in the pitch or the last man in the bullpen, whatever it is, and their command that might not be that sharp, but the umpire in those situations, because it is an 11 run game, they might expand the strike zone a little bit, uh, you know, uh, re- compared to reality. So you'd have to consider factors like that. And look, that's that's an isolated exception. Sure so I, I, I don't even have a big problem with that. Uh, but there is. What we've seen with minor leagues where, where the automated system has been in place is that fundamentally it is a little bit different in terms of what a strike is compared to even what we who we have re- regarded as the best of the best umpires calling balls and strikes. It is a little bit different when you're talking about it because it's where the ball crosses the plate. Okay, the front of the plate, the middle of the plate, the back, you know, the, the back edge of the plate sure uh you know it, it will eliminate the need for pitch framing for catchers and not to say that that's a bad thing but how we value catchers will change then so you know it, it's just there's more to think about than just great points proving accuracy of balls and strikes and look i'm not saying that to be opposed to the idea it's just there are factors here that major league baseball and consultants that are helping Major League Baseball, which you know include Theo Epstein, for example, the the longtime GM of the, you know, president of the uh, former president of the Cubs, and uh, of course, uh, you know, former GM of the Red Sox, that they have to work through the these ideas and at least think about them, at least be prepared for what that means. In the same way that you know, with the pitch timer and eliminating the shift and bigger bases, you know, the rules that have been put in place this year that I think widely. You know, are widely viewed as a smashing success, but there were also factors to consider there. Like, for example, having a pitch timer increasing stolen bases. Now, I think that's been a positive. I think most people would view that as a positive, mm-hmm. but there was also a thought of, does this go too much in the other direction and right. then we have to rein it back? So, so you know, again, these are just the factors that you're working through. And obviously you have an umpire's union <laughs> that uh, uh, certainly have something to say about this as well. So, it's going to come, it's going to happen at some point. You know, I, I don't know if it's going to be 2024 or, uh, you know, uh, it takes a couple more years after that, but it feels inevitable. Uh, and I, I, again, based on what we see, and so much of this is the naked eye, the human eye. I just don't think th- this isn't a matter of umpires being, you know, that they're really, some are bad at their job, but I think a lot of these missed calls come down to, you were talking about an object moving at such an extraordinary speed with such extraordinary movement in many cases that I don't know how you can possibly try to really judge that consistently without coming back to, or you're just resorting to guessing at the end of the day a lot of times. So uh, I think an automated system certainly makes sense. Uh, Well put, well said, and well thought out, Luke. Uh, Shohei Otani, uh, the Orioles were reportedly one of a handful of teams that did, the due, or that did their due diligence to, um, to see what a trade would look like. Uh, now, the Angels have supposedly pulled them off the market, but who knows, right? There, there smoke, there's some smoke there and uh, maybe an eventual fire, but is there a scenario where you, you, you could see uh, a player of his caliber on the Baltimore Orioles, because to me, you're getting, you're really getting two for the price of one, and you're not getting two mediocre positions. You're getting, you know, two quality positions and starting pitcher and, and, a, and a power hitter. Yeah, it's over, and I'll tell you why. Because <laughs> late, yeah, you know, late you on Wednesday you night, don't think, you don't want to think about it. <laughs> no, no. Well, I'll tell you why it's over. It's not because it wouldn't be a heck of a lot of fun. And look, I never thought for a second that the Orioles were going to seriously consider giving up what it would take to acquire Shohei Otani for a rental. You know, I mean, they right. weren't going to resign him. And, and look, 100%. Uh, Nestor, Nestor and I talked about this a lot. You know, hey, why not? But reality is also, you have to face right. that when you're talking about these things. But well, the, the Angels... The question, the question is, can they win this year? And, and this would this be the guy that would put him over the top this year? Because if you would ask me as a fan, if 
they have a shot to get in the series or win the series by adding this guy and giving up whatever, I'm all in. But it's not a guarantee. Of course, we know that. Right, exactly. And again, I mean, I, I've seen a couple talking heads on MLB Network and, and, and various places utter the su- have absolutely utter the suggestion that the Orioles should trade Jackson Holiday for a, a two month rental of Shohei Otani, which that's just nuts. Not going to However, happen. I'll tell you why it's over. And Dennis, th- this happened late Wednesday night. The Angels are buyers. They just acquired Lucas Giolito and. Uh, Reynaldo yeah. Lopez from the Chicago White Sox. So Otani's off the market and, and the Angels are trying, you know, and they've played better baseball of late, despite their many injuries. They're trying to win. So Shohei Otani, barring something completely unforeseen over the last over the next several days leading up to the trade deadline, he's staying put. You can question it all you want if you're looking at the long-term benefits and health uh, of the Angels organization, knowing that it feels Highly unlikely that Otani's going to resign there, but and and I said this uh, all along. You, you look at uh, Moreno, the owner of the Angels. You know he he's a, a very you know, very proud individual in terms of wanting to try to bring a winner to the Angels. I mean, it's been what twenty one years since they've won a World Series, and we've talked so much in recent years about how they've squandered Mike Trout uh, and now Shohei Otani as well. So. They're, it looks like they're all in to try to win. And they're not that far out from a wild card spot, in fairness to them. But it'll be interesting to see how it plays out. So more than any other reason, Dennis, that's why at this point, and I'm not saying you specifically, lots of Orioles fans are dreaming about this, but the dream is officially dead. Shohei Otani staying put with, with the Angels. And I certainly would not anticipate the Orioles uh, – being in that market to try to sign him in the off season. But boy, the idea of him hitting at Camden yards and you and I uh-huh. talked about this when the angels were in town earlier this year, that that ball that he hit to right center over the bleachers and hit that pillar, uh, you know, that the only thing that kept it from landing on Utah street uh, and Boog's barbecue. I mean, the idea of Otani taking aim at the warehouse, which has never been hit before in a game. I mean, boy, that would be fun, but uh, at this point, it's going to remain a dream based on how the Angels are proceeding, uh, you know, trying to buy and uh, having added some pitching this week. Great stuff, Luke. Uh, I'm looking at the Orioles prospects list, and it's really, really mind-blowing how many good players, how many great prospects they still have. And we're not just talking about Jackson Holiday, but sure. uh, Heston Kerstad, he's there. Joey Ortiz. Absolutely tearing it up, right? There's kind of Norby. Uh, Kobe Mayo is down there. Uh, D.L. Hall. I mean, we have so many great prospects. Where are these guys going to go? And, and at what point do you bring them up? Whether uh, you move away from Mateo, um, uh, uh, Hicks. I mean, at, at what point do they start making these moves? Yeah, I mean, that's the big question. And that's why it's so pertinent uh, for the trade deadline specifically, where you look at this. And uh, I mean... This is kind of twofold. One, yeah, you're going to have to move some of these guys, and at some point you do want to augment your major league roster. Whether we're talking about the trade de- deadline here in the next few days or this offseason or next trade deadline or next offseason. I mean, uh, you just look at the simple reality of where the Orioles are from a pitching standpoint. Uh, Grayson Rodriguez is back in the majors. Great. You know, you hope he fares well uh, You know, uh, against the Yankees this weekend, and certainly you're hoping he fares well the rest of the way because you need that upside. You know, you need him, uh, and, and, you know, He's right now he's their number five starter, but you're hoping he can slot it in higher than that. Uh, you know whether we're talking about this year and certainly moving forward. Uh, so so you have that factor. But the other factor to consider here, and this doesn't necessarily pertain to the trade deadline, you know, coming up next week, but when you look at where the Orioles stand right now with players like, and, and I'm just I'm not saying that I'm moving on from all of these guys, but Austin Hayes getting more expensive getting older in terms of where he stands with club control, where he stands in terms of getting the free agency, Cedric Mullins, Anthony Santander, Ryan Mountcastle is going to be approaching that. So what that means is not that all those guys are just going to automatically be traded, but you evaluate where you are and you just said it. I mean, Colton Kowser's back in the majors now and with uh, Mullins and Hicks both on the IL. He's playing a heck of a lot right now, Uh, and he's viewed, at least at this point, unless you trade him. And again, that pertains to any of their young players 
basically not named Gunnar Henderson, Adley Rutschman, uh, Jackson Holiday, Heston Kerstad, probably Grayson Rodriguez. Um, beyond those guys, everyone else you can kind of talk uh, about through the lens of they could be moved. So what you could see end up happening is, again, not at the trade deadline, but this offseason, Anthony Santander's due for uh, another bump in pay. But you have these young options who you're actually, you know, if you're an organization worth its salt and, and you have the conviction in the players that you've picked and developed, you're hoping has a higher ceiling and is younger than him. So what you can then do is perhaps you trade Santander with one or two of these prospects that, that you reeled off. And maybe you go get a starting pitcher in the winter or you go get something else that you need uh, over the winter. So so that's where you're looking at it. I mean, you're, you're looking in the short term. You're looking at what you can do to improve your chances for the rest of this season. And absolutely, I, I, I absolutely want to see Mike Elias be prudent and be responsible about it. Don't be reckless and, and giving up the farm. But if there's a deal or two that makes sense, absolutely pull the trigger. But then when you're talking about all these prospects, you get into the off season, you get into where you are with some of your other players at where they are with you know, arbitration. We know there's no salary cap, but the reality is you're also not going to pay everyone long-term. Uh, it, you know, just like we see with the NFL, you know, you pick your players that you consider to be your core guys and then other guys, you know, you either trade them or they move on and you get compensatory comp- uh, pick compensation. Uh, so, you know, that's that, that's kind of where they are. But you're absolutely right. You look at the system right now and, you know, a player like Connor Norby, I don't know where he's going to play. Right. You know, I've, I've, Joey Ortiz, one one theory I've had about him and why he played so little when he was in the minors uh, or when he was in the majors earlier this season and why they've held on to Mateo as long as they have uh, is one, they're hoping to to untap the Mateo that we saw in April and at times last year. But I mean, three months into this thing at, at some point, it's just like it's 28. This is who he is. Yeah. Uh, but my theory on kind of hiding Ortiz the way they did is I wonder if he's the guy that they kind of view and he's a top 100 prospect in all of baseball. Yes. Maybe he's a guy that they kind of earmark to say, this is probably going to be one of our big pieces that we're willing to deal if the right pitcher or the right piece is a, out there in a trade at the deadline now i could be totally wrong about that and by the time you and i uh you know by some by the time someone's listening to this conversation maybe they brought up joey ortiz and dfa mateo uh but you know you, you just look at these guys and your points well taken on the pitching side not so much right i mean they have they need more pitching and Cade povich and you know if dl hall ever gets right physically uh you know we'll yeah, we'll, we'll see those guys in the majors, but on the position player side, boy, there's just, there are so many names and we know not all of them are going to work out. I mean, Kyle Stowers, you know, even though it wasn't a long addition in the major leagues, but he really struggled. And, you know, at this point, you don't really view him through the same lens as we did a year ago at this time. So not everyone is going to pan out, but th- with the sheer numbers that you have in your system, you're going to have to make some moves. Now, again, that doesn't mean you should do all of it at by August 1st, you know, certainly you don't want to go make a bad deal just for the sake of making a deal, but something's going to have to give at some point. And let's keep in mind, this is a good problem to have. <laughs> These are good problems to have when you have too many young players. So it'll be fascinating to see how Mike Elias approaches the, these next few days. Uh, and I'm really interested to see, assuming let, let's just make an assumption that the Orioles don't win the World Series. You know, they they go to the playoffs. Maybe they win a series, but, you know, they're eliminated because you know, that's kind of how it works. You know, there are no guarantees, even if you're the best team uh, in the league. But I'll be fascinated to see what the or- what that means for the Orioles moving forward this offseason after having the year they've had and knowing that they've got this crunch and these players at AAA that, you know, frankly – not everyone's going to be able to play in the majors for the Orioles. So how do you proceed? And that's where I think you could see a mix of them moving on from a veteran or two uh, in the right trade, mm-hmm. promoting from within. And, you know, kind of, you know, it, it's kind of the roster turn that the Orioles have talked a lot about wanting to be like the Tampa Bay Rays, quite frankly. And I hope, I very much hope that the the difference will be a willingness to spend more in terms of major league payroll to keep some of your young stars long-term and, Look, that gets into John Angelos, ownership, the long-term lease, all the different things we've talked about off the field. But in terms of 
how the Rays have approached their farm system and drafting and developing and also international prospects, which the Orioles remain a work in progress in, but are at sure. least dipping their toes into that after not even trying for years and years and years. There's going to be some churn. There are going to be players that uh, you know, t- fans are going to get attached to that are end up being moved at some point in time. But you could say the same thing about the Ravens, right? I mean, we, we can all remember players that they've moved on from that seemed like a really big deal at the time. But in most cases, they ended up being fine long term. So I think the Orioles are you know, going to be approaching that period of time, more so in the offseason. But again, we'll kind of see uh, what moves are made here in the coming days. Uh, Great stuff, Luke. Uh, Moving forward to the Ravens, uh, I read with great interest uh, your your column on the 12 thoughts uh, on day one of training camp. Uh, I saw the press conferences, the limited press conferences of John Harbaugh, Marlon Humphrey and and Lamar Jackson. I I heard the kids excitement chanting uh, Odell, Odell while uh, Humphrey was trying to to talk into the mic. So lots of excitement uh, around the Ravens these days. No question about it. I, I'm at, I'm glad you mentioned Odell Beckham, and I even heard this <laughs> this term from uh, another reporter who I don't even think is a pro wrestling fan, but they made note that Odell Beckham got the biggest pop of the day, and then, you know, <laughs> popping pop the, the crowd. That's a pro wrestling <laughs> term. So I, I I was into that. He did, but he did. Uh, yeah, the, the reaction to Beckham, and I, I can't say I was stunned by this, but maybe to the degree that we heard, and and look, it was also the first day. Lots of kids out there. But the reaction to him certainly reinforces some of those perceptions out there that the Ravens spent the amount that they did. And let's be clear, they overpaid for Odell Beckham Jr. They did. There's no question about it. Even even if you're 100% all in on the move, I, I think you acknowledge that. But I think this went beyond even appeasing Lamar Jackson, even having an optimistic outlook on what he can still bring to the field even with his injuries and injury and and his history and and two ACL surgeries in the last three years. But I think there was another side to this. When you consider OBJ's influence from a social media standpoint, go look and see how many followers he has on Instagram, for example. It's stunning. Well, when you look at those factors and look, I'm not saying that that should be, you know, but he shouldn't drive your roster decisions, but but that's part of it in the same way. In the same way that to a man, and even if the Ravens didn't come out and say it at the time, but there was absolutely some of that element involved when the Ravens made the decision to target Lamar Jackson in the draft and replace Joe Flacco and kind of move on from what had been. And not all Flacco's fault. Flacco's fault by all means. And, you know, we don't need to rehash that. We talked about that. There are a lot of things that didn't go well, uh, you know, from management on down for the post-Super Bowl 47 Flacco era uh, of Ravens football. But there was absolutely some appeal to, hey, draft this kid that's this amazing athlete. We can probably, you know, he's not going to go in the top five or the top ten. I mean, the Ravens passed on him once, uh, as we remember. Uh, but there was some, you know, the flavor, so to speak, of uh, drafting a young quarterback with that kind of you know, swagger, the fact that he'd won a Heisman Trophy, the fact that he was such an electrifying player at Louisville. I think there's some of those same elements at work here when the Ravens and Steve Bashotti, who we know got directly involved in this negotiation, targeted Obel- Odell Beckham Jr. Now, Odell's not a kid coming out of college, and uh, I-, I think it's very important to recognize that he's not the guy that he was with the New York Giants. And I don't think the Ravens think that either, but as long as he can be a productive player for them, as long as he can be a positive on the field and get along with everyone in the locker room. And we know that there's a history of some baggage, at least perceived, you know, how much of it was uh, perception versus reality. You know, I, I think you'll find lots of players that will vouch for Beckham being a good teammate, but you'll find some other guys who would say not so much. So we'll see how that plays out. But there was definitely an off the field element here. And keep in mind that that signing occurred at a time when Lamar Jackson had still not been signed long-term season ticket sales, you know, from what I understand at that point in time, were lagging a little more than maybe the Ravens anticipated. So, you know, you do something like that and we'll see how it works out. And ultimately look, if Beckham can't play anymore, all that spice and pizzazz that I that I'm talking about, that and and the pop that we heard the first day of training camp, 
none of that'll matter and that'll dissipate very quickly if he looks like an old man out there who can't run anymore but the ravens are clearly banking on him uh you know being a a little more of a you know a little more of a lightning rod in a good way for them on the field and you know to add a little you know add a little more pizzazz off the field for them which from a branding standpoint you know i don't need to tell you dennis uh, you're you know you're a businessman uh, that that matters you know he, even if that shouldn't take precedent over what happens on the field for a team that's still that's part of part of the whole evaluation picture so you know that was you know kind of the most interesting you know i've buzzworthy uh, part of, of day one but and we'll get into this uh, i'm sure here uh I think the big story of the day was kind of confirming what we had been expecting, what we'd been anticipating for a while, at least the possibility. Uh, I think it's safe to say that J.K. Dobbins is holding in. No one's saying that officially, and John Harbaugh didn't offer him any cover, but also did not say, well, no, he's not hurt, uh, because, hey, the team themselves put him on the PUP list. But I think it's very evident, and again, I think we were anticipating the possibility of this that uh, J.K. Dobbins making a business decision right now, and we can certainly get into what's rational about it, what would be irrational about it. But uh, long story short, you know, he's the one guy that whose absence is not easily explained right now. And John Harbaugh said it's not a simple answer, but I think it actually is a very simple answer. But mm. coming, you know, come finding a solution. Good luck on that uh, if you're J.K. Dobbins. Well, a couple of, of points here, Luke. First, with Odell Beckham Jr., just watching him, listening to him, he seems to have matured uh, as, as a person. He's been there, done that. He's been dinged up. He's uh, He contributed to the Super Bowl, then he didn't finish. Uh, he has some unfinished business. I like his mindset. I like the fact that uh, he views this as potentially his last season. To me, not that I think he believes that, but I think he values it, and he's going to play like it's his last season. And I think it's a, it bodes well for the uh, the Baltimore Ravens in terms of his contributions, uh, if he's able physically to contribute. Now, with J.K. Dobbins, uh, and even with John Harbour, I thought he gave a very mature response. Uh, I, I, it was more than what I expected him to say. But I feel for J.K. Dobbins, I have empathy for him. Um, he got hurt in an exhibition game. And that's, that's the one thing that really bugs me. Um, uh, and I understand organizations have to make business decisions. But here's a guy you asked to go into a meaningless game against the commanders. And he blows out his knee, costing him potentially millions of dollars and also costing you potential games. Um, look, and it was in the year where I believe Gus Edwards and uh, uh, Marcus Peters got hurt on back-to-back non-contact plays. So I get that injuries can happen. But for J.K. to get hurt in a meaningless game really rubs me the wrong way to not really try to make an effort of some type, not saying that they're not, but to try to accommodate the young man, because I'm, I'm a huge JK Dobbins fan. Yeah. I, I'm not saying they got to break open the piggy bank, but to me, right. as an owner, as a general manager, as a head coach, I would have to have empathy for this guy because he's a dog. I mean, you, you, you can tell he loves football. He had a ton of carries in, 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 in college. I guarantee you had a ton of carries in high school and maybe peewee ball. He's got some tread on him, but they're a lot better when he's on the field than when he's not. And I wouldn't blame him if he didn't play until game one, whatever the consequence. Well, I, I think that would be foolish of him to hold out if he's only going to show up the, the first, you know, the first week because he's putting himself in bad position to, to not have a great season. He, he is, but I, don't see um, an up, but I don't see an upside to him practicing, going through training camp, even if he has a hell of a year, Luke. The market for running backs has been greatly diminished, right? It's not going to be a great market for them next year either. Well, but I feel like some of what you just said, Dennis, if I'm the Ravens, that's why I'm not in any hurry to pay him long term. I don't disagree with you. I'm telling you, if I'm the Ravens, I'm not so sure that I would – I would just do more for him, a little bit more than any other running back in this position, given the fact that my head coach, which I love John Harbaugh, but – in retrospect, in hindsight, I don't know that I would ever play any of my starters in, in, in the priest if I know what they can do. Right. And believe me, year two, we knew what J.K. Dobbins was capable of. There was no need for him to get out there, show what he can do. And yeah, to me, the I, preseason game should be for street free agents, you know, late round draft picks, guys that you're trying to fill roster holes with, maybe get your backup quarterback some work, but not your starters. I hear you on that. And, and I think the Ravens 
they've learned their lesson in that way. But I will say this. I mean, let's also not pretend like playing starters in the preseason is some unheard of. No, absolutely not. So far out in left field kind of concept that, the, I mean, Andy Reid still plays starters or has in recent years, you know, even since I hear you. then. So I, hear you. so I I hear everything you're saying. I, I think for me, it's very simple. I can empathize with J.K. Dobbins, but I don't think the Ravens wronged him. I, we can we can agree or disagree whether that was smart to do, but I don't think this was some egregious thing that they did where they just didn't care about the kid. Oh, or no, I'm like not that. suggesting right, that. Right. I'm just, say, I'm just so, saying that like, I like to see – some. and again, maybe it's there. Maybe we're not seeing it. But I like to see some empathy uh, towards him instead of with just a cut and uh, cut and dry business deal. This is it. You yeah. know, you, you've had too I many just, injuries and blah, blah, blah. Uh, not saying even if he was completely healthy, we, we would still be in the same situation. I still don't well, think and that's right. Yeah. Right. I think I think that's go ahead. Sorry. No, I don't think it would change the market value a whole lot. I just don't. I think it's just it's a cop out to say that because the the fact of the matter is, even if, he, if you'd never been hurt before, his market value still wouldn't be what he wanted. Well, no different I agree than with that. Barkley or Josh Jacobs or the rest of the guys, Austin Eckler, all the guys are on a Zoom call a few days ago. Right. But I mean, his injury history does affect his market value because I don't, you know, when you have that kind of a serious knee injury, I don't know how you're going to hold up. And, you know, you look at Todd Gurley, for example, you know, so Todd Gurley is so, a big reason but, why we're in this position today with the running backs. So he's, he's a big, big one. I mean, I just, I'm, I'm empathetic to these running backs. I am, but I also, you know, if, if I'm a fan of a team, I also don't want my team to arbitrarily ignore the market just because I empathize for, but because we're not the difference here, Dennis, if this were major league baseball and you could just spend as much as you wanted, then I'd hear that argument way more, but you have a finite you. number of resources in which you can spend. So it's like, okay, running backs deserve more. So who gets less then? quarterbacks well quarterbacks are way more valuable than running backs lamar jackson's so much more important to this team than jk dobbins and you know just about every single team that's worth its salt says the same thing about their quarterback compared to a running back i think the, the only factor that's at work here and, and i think you and i actually agree on this point because you alluded to it and i'm going to say this now this, this hold in is not going to get jk dobbins an extra dime from the ravens it's not of course uh, I, I don't think it's going to do, you know, they're not going to trade them. They're playing nice. Unlike Jim Ursay going on Twitter and oh talking about God, what an Taylor, idiot. which, which that's dumb. You know, I, I mean, you uh, can feel that way. And look, what he said, isn't necessarily wrong. Agreed. This is very much a CBA issue and players are, or the, the NFL PA. Why has say been anything? Criticized. What, an, what an embarrassment. Why sure. say anything? Why sure. alienate exactly. your players, your locker room, you know, he is, this is, this is for a team that won four games last year. Right. What do you think the morale is? Well, <laughs> you just destroyed your running and hired back. Je and hired Jeff Saturday as their interim coach. Oh but, my you know, Lord. That... <laughs> so what a, what a, thank God they moved away from us back in 80, 83, whatever the, the year was. Thank God. <laughs> what I will say with, with J.K. Dobbins, to me, the only logical way to look at this at this point, and, and I think he and his representation, I mean, if they're not facing reality at this point, I mean, look what happened with Sa Saquon Barkley. You know, the, the running backs had the big Zoom call, and basically a, a few days later, the Giants basically found some loose change in, in their couch and said, here, we'll give you this. And he signed. And look, Barkley <laughs> did what he had to do there. And it, that, I'm not even saying that that was wrong uh, for right. him to do it, but it just speaks to the lack of leverage. I think the only way that this makes sense for, for J.K. Dobbins, and I think this is where fans, and I think the team, at least at the moment, need to keep level heads about this is if D Dobbins is looking at this and saying, I'm going to try to reduce my perceived risk in taking part in a full training camp. I know he's not going to play in preseason games. John Harbaugh is not going to play anyone, but Understood. kind of their less proven starters at this point in time. So uh, I, again, he's not the first guy to get hurt in a preseason game. So he's I, not. while I'm empathetic, okay. I don't think that the Ravens are, that, that there's any obligation for them to try to go above and beyond to to appease him because the other thing is if you do that then you have to do it for the next guy and suddenly everyone's going to start holding in so but the point is for me the best case scenario for him if i'm jk dobbins looking at this objectively trying to benefit myself sure hold in for the first couple of weeks of training camp 
you know, hit the practice field August 15th, something like that. Still gives you close to a month to get ready. You've mitigated some of the early camp risk. Sure. I'm assuming you come in in great shape. Assuming you're ready to have your best season yet, because boy, you need to have that. And it we does. can debate what his market value is going to be for the Ravens or any of the 31 other teams. But it's a moot point if he can't stay on the field again, or if he doesn't have his best season, he's not going to get paid very much. I mean, that's just the Agreed. truth. You know, we might not get paid very much, even if he has a, a really good season. Uh, so that's what he needs to do. However, I think he has to be careful here not to overplay his hand, which to me would be, holding out the entire preseason, only showing up the first week of the regular season on the practice field. And keep in mind, he's in the building. He's going through meetings. He was out on the practice field and even talked with Eric DaCosta and Steve Bishotti on Wednesday afternoon, about an hour into the session, and they exchanged pleasantries. I'm guessing there was a whole lot of fake going on uh, in those exchanges, (laughs) but everyone was playing nice uh, in that moment, and that was good to see. But I think where Dobbins could run into trouble here is if you're too emotional about this and you're too much – into I'll show them I'm going to try to prove try to prove a point to the Ravens and you come in keep in mind new offensive system even though mentally he might be up to speed physically there's still something to be said sure. even if a running back doesn't have quite as much uh, that doesn't entail quite as much as say a, a quarterback learning Todd Munkin's offense but if he comes in onto the practice field too late gets hurt isn't in the be- the best football shape and doesn't have the best season then I think this will look like a severe misfire. And I think perception of him will also not look as good from the Ravens perspective or other teams. So I think the middle road here is again, you know, you kind of look at view him as the Ravens have handled some of their guys coming off injuries like they did Dobbins last summer, for example, where you say, you know what, as long as he's out there by August 15th, you know, you, you ramp him up, you know, he'll he'll do limited reps early on, and then you just ramp it up. He'll have plenty of time to be ready for the start of the regular season. But again, that's also acknowledging Dobbins is putting a lot on himself, because when you do something like that, it's not just that you open yourself up for scrutiny with the organization, but let's also keep in mind, Dennis, and look, Lamar Jackson said all the right things yesterday, and Lamar's no secret, obvious, or no stranger to contract situations, but J.K. Dobbins is contractually obligated to be out there if he actually is healthy. And all of his teammates are out there practicing in the hot sun in Owings Mills. So I do think if you're him, and not that that I would anticipate it causes this major rift or breaks apart the locker room. I mean, it's not the franchise quarterback after all. It's a running back. And I, I say that not to try to be disparaging, but the league is showing you how they value the position. It's just the truth. But there, I, you do wonder if this stretches out too long where he's sitting out the entire preseason and not on the practice field until yep. September 2nd, then I think how the organization feels, and yes, at least how some of his teammates would feel about that would be much different than what we're talking about today. So I don't think this is a big deal, a, a colossal bad deal right now for the Ravens, but I do think it has the potential to, if this does stretch longer past say the middle of August where, you know, if he's on the field by then and look, maybe he's on the field three days from now. And, and maybe, maybe this turns into the Saquon Barkley thing all, all, all over again, where Barkley kind of realized I don't have any leverage. You know, maybe Dobbins will say that and we know he likes to compete and he loves to play football, but that's where I would say, you know, th- there, there is a cautionary tale side to this, where if you wait too long, if you don't come on, if you're not onto the practice field in shape and you get hurt, or if you don't have the best season, you know, even if that's not, you know, even if it's more the offensive line or more other elements at work, you know, that you're not going to be viewed through a very favorable lens by the organization, by some of your teammates, and certainly by the 31 other teams, as we're already talking about what's a very tepid market for running back. So just think that's, that's the factor to acknowledge here, even if you're understanding and empathizing where Dobbins is coming from, from a business side. Well, as a former high school and college running back, I, I have strong thoughts on this uh, on this subject. There's more meat on this bone, and <laughs> our listeners are lucky, or maybe you're lucky that we I'm up against the clock. But 
we'll pick this up uh, next week because I'm not I'm not done talking about this. So Luke, please tell us what's going on over there at WNST, all the great stuff that you do, your blog and, and everything else that you do for Baltimore Positive, WNST 1570 AM. Absolutely. I encourage everyone to follow us at WNST and my, myself personally at Baltimore Luke on various social media outlets, Twitter, threads, uh, you name it, uh, Facebook, of course. Uh, check out my blog at BaltimorePositive.com. Sponsored by Coons for the Baltimore. My latest 12 Ravens thoughts. Uh, every practice I attend, you know, the goal is to offer my 12 thoughts, which are largely observations, also with some news items mixed in there. So you can check that out at BaltimorePositive.com. Check out my column at BaltimorePositive.com. Currently on the J.K. Dobbins situation, which I touched on a lot of what I just mentioned. I don't think it's the end of the world at the moment, but I do think J.K. Dobbins needs to proceed with caution, understanding if this stretches out too long, potential fallout and uh, some pitfalls that could actually hurt his long-term value. Uh, so you check that out at BaltimorePositive.com. You want to be on the WNST Baltimore Positive Tech Service, sponsored by Coons Florida Baltimore. Uh, any significant local sports news sent directly to your mobile device, whether it's a Ravens roster move, whether it is an Orioles trade between now and August 1st, any significant local sports news sent directly to your mobile device. And of course, anything throughout the week on AM 1570 with Nestor. Any Ravens players and coaches interviews from Owings Mills as training camp is underway. Any Orioles, Brandon Hyde, players from the clubhouse, coaches, what have you. Any of that, you can check it out at BaltimorePositive.com. Luke, as, as always, I appreciate you. I don't know if you can see my sign here. It says Team JK. <laughs> I leave that up there. But thank you for all you do. I, I miss talking to you. I'm glad we we caught up. We we still left some uh, some meat on the table here. So uh, we'll pick it up again next week. I appreciate you. Absolutely. Next week at this time, we'll be full blow in the training camp. The pads will be on, so we'll have more Center. to talk about there. And on the Orioles side, trade deadline. What yes, happened, sir. what didn't happen, and we'll see uh, what that means for the Orioles the rest of the way. So looking forward to it, Dennis. All right, my friend. Stay well. There he goes, Luke Jones here, 1570 AM, Baltimore Positive, celebrating our 25th year on the air. We'll take a quick break and come back right after this.